Hey everyone, this is Ben. I hope you can hear me fairly well today. I'm driving on I-20 in Atlanta. And I want to talk about a very basic question that's come up a million times. And the question is, do we really need God anymore? Maybe science can't explain everything we see. Everything that happens can be explained in terms of science. And science is, as people say, omnipotent in a sense, in, in its ability to explain. And so what do we need God for? And so to give a little bit of background to this, you know, in ancient times when you got sick, they might have said, they might have said it was Zeus that made you sick. He struck you down with something or Yahweh, you know, struck the people with a plague because they sinned or you, you angered the gods or maybe in medieval times people would have said, you know, it was witchcraft. And, and in the modern age we say, oh, there was bacteria in the water. You have cholera, you know, you need an injection. It's it's microscopic bacteria that you can't see with the naked eye. They're invisible, but we can see them with microscopes and we know what's going on now. And all that prayer doesn't work, but la, 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 we give you penicillin or something like this. And all of a sudden you're better. Look whose theory is correct. And we can explain so many things that happen in terms of, of science and scientific explanations. Or here's another example. In very ancient times, people thought that the orbits of the planets were perfectly circular because the gods would have made them circular <laughs> and they thought that the planets were gods in the heavens and that they prayed to them and, and they thought that when the moon was a certain way that would make the crops be a certain way or make their life go a certain way and, and the word lunatic comes from the old idea that uh, the lunar cycle controls people's insanity because the moon is some kind of craziness god the, the, the moon is some kind of craziness god okay and, you know, over time, people get better and better understandings of the physical world. You get to Isaac Newton, who says, you know, the planet's orbits around the sun, they're not circular, they're elliptical. And I don't have to explain them. They, they had all these, like, weird circles to try to make sense of it. And, and it was like circle, and then, like, it would go in another circle as it went in a circle, in a little circle, and then a little circle around the circle. And they're called epi circles, and it was really ridiculous. And you know, Isaac came in and said, hey, you can just make them ellipses and then it all makes perfect sense. And if you don't put the earth at the center of the universe, then you put the sun at the center and all kinds of things make sense. And, you know, we don't really need God to explain all this. But, but Isaac Newton, he couldn't explain, you know, why the orbits of the planets didn't degenerate and crash into the sun. So he said, well, that's where God comes in. And God comes in and he fixes the orbits. And so this is called the God of the Gaps problem because today... We don't need God to explain why the orbits of the planets don't degenerate and crash all and will all crash into the sun over time. And so a lot of people say, well, this right here, this thing that happened, there's no way to explain why that happened without unless without saying God did it. And God did it is the explanation. And people say, well, that's a God of the gaps because that's just a lazy attempt at science. And one day in the future, we'll be able to explain this thing without God. And so what do we need God for? And so this becomes an argument against the existence of God is that we don't really need God for anything. We can explain everything that we see without God. And the things that we can't explain, well, one day we'll explain them. Look at all the stuff that we used to couldn't explain. We'll, you know, why give up on science? Keep working hard and we'll explain everything. You know, science is omnipotent. Okay. This is a bad obje objection to the Christian God the God of Christianity. This really doesn't defeat the God of Christianity at all, although it does defeat other gods. It's a great defeater against, the, say, the polytheistic mini-gods of the ancient Greek world because they argued and, and were bitter against one another, and uh, they would have to interfere all the time. In other words, because they didn't get along and didn't see eye to eye, they didn't really have like a, a plan for how the world works that they all saw eye to eye on, you know, there was no unified plan. One God made his plans and, you know, another God, a goddess over here, she made totally different plans and they were sneaky and would sneak kind of all kinds of plans past each other, you know, so the God Odin had magic words that he created, but they were secret words and if you knew the magic words, you would put it on your axe and then it would make the good guys, they would know the word to write on the axe and the special letters in the runes and then that would, Loki, the bad God, he didn't know the, the secret stuff and so like, you knew the word because you had passed down the secret tradition of the magic words, and then your axe would hit, and you would win. 
you know, and so there was all kind of stuff like that. And of course, Loki had secrets with a magic ring and where the Lord of the Rings supposedly is inspired from. But the point is, is in the Middle Ages, Christians realized that this stuff doesn't apply to the Christian God because the Christian God is so different. And the Christian God is different because the Christian God is the only God and he's perfect and he knows everything and he has a perfect plan for everything. And so the Christians, there was a particular school of monks in the Middle Ages called the Scholastics. And what the Scholastics came up with is this idea of what they called secondary causation. That God could control everything that happened by, in just the way that he set up the universe in the first place. The way he made the world in the first place, he could create it where it, it all works out according to his plan. So this is like an engineer. You know, I, I used to be a mechanical engineering student, and a good mechanism or any good work of engineering, whether it be civil engineering like a bridge or circuitry, electrical engineering, double E, whatever, or if you're ME like I was, the uh, a good engineer designs something so that you don't have to come in and do repairs. It just works the way it was planned, and everything worked out the way you intended it in the first place. And so that's kind of the idea. What if God made the universe with a plan in mind so that it was like a big machine that just worked the way he intended it to, so that nothing would happen that wasn't according to his will because he already planned for everything. And if you have a really, 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 really great, high, lofty concept of God, then this is actually possible. It's only possible with a truly, truly, maximally great God, a God of maximal greatness. But that just so happens to be the Christian concept of God. And so... What this means is these scholastic monks came up with the idea of what we today call scientific law, law in nature. They were looking for God's plan for how the world works. They said, I bet everything works according to a simple pattern. And that's where scientific law came from. That's where the idea of scientific law came from. Everything works according to a simple pattern. And in fact, if there is no God, there's no good reason to think that it's necessarily that way. You could have things work differently each time. And who's to say, you know, or, or the, the way in which things work might be really, really complicated and not simple equations like we always look for in science. In science, you want to find really simple, straightforward equations like force equals mass times acceleration or energy equals mass times the speed of light squared. Okay? That there's uniformity to the way the world works. That on Mars, when water flows down a hill, it makes alluvian plains and it, it, it deposits sediment according to basic principles and fundamental laws of science that work the same throughout the universe. This is a Christian idea that came from Christian monks in the Middle Ages. And if there is no God, who's to say that it's really that way? Maybe it's super not that way at all. Maybe everything, you know, is much more complicated and works differently in different cases, and there's no real law that you can come up with. It's maybe the laws of nature are as just as complicated as the way nature is. And there's no simple plan that every that predicts every little thing that happens. Okay. So what this means is very straightforward. The God of the Gaps objection isn't a good objection to the existence of the Christian God. It just really it really is not a good way to object to the Christian God because the Christian God really wouldn't need to interfere in the universe. He wouldn't need to come in and mess with things. He could just create things and voila. And you say, well, how do we attack your God then? This is, you know, you poke your, you poke your lips out and say, well, we're sad. Well, that's not the Christian's fault. You atheists, if you want to criticize God, then come up with criticisms that actually attack God really. Okay, but not in you know criticisms that are completely irrelevant. And the bottom line is, this criticism is completely irrelevant. I hope you enjoyed this video. Thank you for your time.